love that. Hey, it's so good to be in the house of the Lord today. Come on, let's, let's hear it if you're happy to be in the house of the Lord today. One more time. If you're excited to be in the house of the Lord today, let me hear you today. Come on. Woo, I tell you what, there it was. All I needed was one more ask, and you had it. Great to see you today. My name is Elliot. My wife Tiffany and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. If this is one of your first, second, third times here, I just want to personally, I know they already did it and everything, but personally, I'm so glad you're here. Um, it is an honor and a privilege for you to spend your Sunday morning with us. Hey, welcome to this, to this special day. This is Palm Sunday. For those of you who don't know, this is Palm Sunday. This is the day that Jesus historically came riding into the city of Jerusalem on that donkey, and they laid the palm branches down. That's why it's called Palm Sunday. And it, it signals the beginning of the end and then the beginning again. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. That, it just means that, that the anniversary of what our Savior did is, is right in front of us. And it's going to be so, it's gonna be so exciting. Uh, this, this week, this Saturday, we are doing our annual Easter outreach where we're going to be reaching thousands of people uh, with the love of Christ, no strings attached, giving gifts away, giving prizes. This is your opportunity, by the way, church, to be the church in the community. Um, we've created a way, this, this outreach is a way for you to be involved and say, hey, I don't just go to Lifeline, I am a Lifeline. Can I get an amen on that? So that today, to, today, today, today is your opportunity to sign up to be a part of that amazing, there's going to be so many families at this event at Hutchins Street Square where we're going to be scattering 15,000 eggs around. It's going to be bigger than ever before. And this is your opportunity to just go and say, hey, love, no strings attached. Church is tomorrow, but I mean, I'm, I'm here to love on you anyways. This is your opportunity. I would love to see every single one of you sign up to volunteer before you hit those doors on the way out to say, you know what? I, I may not even be on the dream team. Maybe I am on the dream team. It doesn't matter who you are. Now, anybody on Facebook wants to be involved in this. This is a way to be a lifeline to your city and wash the feet of the people of this city. It's going to be amazing. And one of your friends that you invite to this outreach and invite to church the next day, Easter Sunday, which is gonna, we're going to do at 10 a.m. right here, one of them is going to win Disneyland money. Come on, $800 to Disneyland. <laughs> Somebody over here said, I'm going to win that. I'm gonna, well, it's for our visitors, okay? We're going to do something for them because we're going to offer them a gift that's tangible, but they're going to, but they're going to, they're going to leave with a gift that's eternal. Can I get one good solid amen for that? That's a great thing to do. Um, and so I'm really excited. about. So there's some things coming up. This is Easter week, and Easter's coming up this Sunday. There's a couple things I'd like to, to just, I, I just lay before you. You can do these things with me if you'd like. Number one, I'd like you to pray. I'm, I'm inviting you as a church uh, to pray uh, for the service coming up. Pray for Pastor Stephen and I as, as your pastors. This is, uh, this is one of the greatest opportunities that we have, which means it's going to be the, the biggest workload that we see. And so we're going to be hitting our knees basically daily and just, you know, preparing like never before. So cover us. Cover your pastors in prayer. Uh, cover this church. Pray over the service that so many people would give their life to Christ and would never go back. Things used to be. Pray. Pray with us. This is our this is our ch culture has given us an opportunity. I mean, historically, do we know if this was the exact day? Not sure who, no one can be sure exactly. But I'll tell you this, in, the, in this culture, we have an opportunity to reach people right now that we don't usually get. Let me tell you about this next thing you can do. Um, you can invite. I, I alluded to it already, but studies say that 80% of people, 80% of people would come to church if they were just invited. Aren't you glad you were invited to church one day? You're probably sitting on some invites right there with the new service time on them. Um, just take some time out of your week. Man, uh, stop by Taco Bell, you know, during the week and, like, invite that person that's taking your money. Invite them to church. Anybody you can't, 8 out of 10 is a high number, and Easter is no exception to that. So you can you can be inviting people. I, I'm doing it too, you, you know. I'm, I'm doing this. I'm and it's as awkward for me as it is for anybody sometimes. You know, hey, um, I don't know, uh, you want to come to church? I don't know. I heard about that church. Their pastor is kind of weird. Oh, no, uh, he's not. He's not. So when I'm inviting people, it's kind of it's different. But I'd love to invite you to do that, too. It's, it's just going to be a really fun day. 
Uh, finally, I'm inviting you to participate. Participate. I am hereby deputizing each and every one of you to be greeters next week. If you see somebody walking in that parking lot, if you see somebody walking in those double doors and they're looking like this, and they don't know where they're going, they don't know where the men's room is, man, you're a greeter that day, all right? Everybody who considers themselves a, a, a lifeliner, you're a greeter that day, all right? Next week is going to be amazing. It's going to be our best Easter ever, and I am so looking forward to it. So with that, I'd love for you to get out your uh, message notes. They should, be, uh, hand, they should have been handed to you there, and we've got some things going on. But I just want to recap this series because we're bringing this series to a close today. This is the last one. I know there are seven statements that Jesus made on that cross, but we only talked about four. We picked the, the four that were going to be uh, just right for us. Um, this series is based on a book called How to Live Through a Bad Day. Go, we're super creative <laughs> about our titles around here. We just took it straight from the book, and we're getting help from uh, Pastor Chris Hodges and Church of the Highlands and, and bringing this content to you. But we picked the best four. But I want to take a second and go over our theme verse and recap those seven statements that Jesus made on that cross. Because if we can study how he did it and study how he made it through his worst day, then maybe, just maybe, we can live through our worst days too. Ever since I started preaching this series, I, I had a couple bad days. I don't know about y'all, but I had a couple bad days, and this stuff has really helped me. So let's read this out of Hebrews 12, starting in verse 2. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. This is my favorite part. Study how he did it. Study how he did it. Because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way, the cross, the shame, whatever, and now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God. Like I said, we were able to talk about four of those seven statements he made, but I want to give them all to you. So if you, wanna, if you like taking extra notes, you can write these in. But the first was, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do, right? And we learned that uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we learned that the first key, the first principle in living through a bad day is forgive everyone who's trying to ruin your life. Come on, who remembers that, that message? That was probably one of my favorite because I got a couple on my list. You know what I'm saying? So I just had to take that one in, preach that one to myself. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The week after that, Tiffany talked about uh, Jesus' statement that he made to the thief beside him. Today, you're going to be with me in paradise. And we learned about that principle of living through a bad day, that when you're going through a bad day, to help others going through a similar struggle that you're going through. Nothing quite takes the edge off as helping someone else in need when we are going through something. And something you got to just, that was a great message, and um, if you missed it, please go back. Now, this is something we did not cover, but I want to give it to you. Um, the third statement that Jesus makes is that he looks down and he sees his mother, Mary, and he sees John, his disciple, and says, John, this, behold, your mother, take Take care. And we learned, uh, well, we didn't learn this, but I, I read the book. I don't know if you did. But we learned that uh, Joseph, um, Jesus' earthly father, must have been gone or else that statement would have been inappropriate to make. And the principle is, is this, that when we're going through a bad day, don't forget to take care of the people closest to you. Because they're the ones that tend to get the worst of our bad day. Come on. When we're going, I don't know about y'all, but when I'm going through a bad day, there is one person in particular that seems to get the worst part of that, and that's the person closest to me, my wife. And so Jesus is showing us in that, that in my bad day, Jesus, in, in his bad day, I'm, I'm not going to forget about the people who are close to me. I'm not going to forget about the people in my family who must be feeling this too. All right, the one after that, statement number four, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, this one's, this one's powerful. This shows us that in our bad day, it's not inappropriate to throw your questions to God. But it also teaches us that we should direct our tough questions to God and not people. Direct your tough questions to God and not to people. After that, after that, Jesus says, I thirst. I thirst. This is statement number five. I thirst. This shows that in his bad day, this shows that even Jesus was human. He had needs. He was thirsty. That sounds like a very human quality. And this principle shows us that when we're having a bad day, don't forget to let people know that you're in need. <laughs> hey, hey, I'm thirsty. I I'm going through it. Not, not to neglect the fact that you are a person with needs and emotions to be human enough to admit your need. 
Last week, we talked about the sixth statement, it is finished. But yet, it wasn't finished, but that's exactly the lesson. That even in the midst of your bad day, even when you're going through something hard, even when you're going through a struggle, you can have an assurance that things are going to be all right. That you can live with a blessed assurance that things are going to be all right. And now, the exhilarating conclusion. The seventh statement that Jesus makes on the cross. We find it in Luke 23. Let's read. By this time, it was about noon. And darkness fell across the whole land until 3 o'clock. The light from the sun was gone, and suddenly the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. Now, that's amazing because, I don't know if you know this, but it used to be that only the high priest, only the high priest could go into the presence of God, and he would make atonement for everybody's sins, but there was a curtain, there was a separation. And when Jesus died on that cross, there was a tearing of that curtain. So there is no more separation between God and us. We can go boldly before the throne of grace and make our request known to him. Come on, that's good news, everybody. That's good news, man. That's that's something that makes you happy in church. There's no more separation. You don't need to come to a priest. You don't need to come to a father. You don't need to come to a pastor to be like, hey, can you tell God something for me? No, you don't need to do that. You can tell him yourself. And I might even tell you to do that. (laughs) Tell him yourself. He's listening. He is listening. But that's not my message for today. The message is verse 46. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. Lesson number four. Write this in. Finally. Surrender your day to God and let it go. And let it go. Now, that's a mouthful right there. That's an easy statement to jot down. But doing it is a whole nother story. Finally, surrender your day to God and let it go. If statement number six last week is a, is a declaration of triumph, like it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. This week calls us to declare trust in God. As Jesus was hanging there, abandoned by God, while he was taking our sins, he trusted his spirit unto God. That's powerful. You will never know, let me tell you something. You will never know God's peace until you trust in him. That goes, if you're a Christian, if you're not a Christian, trust is a separate issue. Like, I can give my life to him but still struggle with trust. Oh, yeah, you can. I can commit my life to my wife but still struggle with trust. It's a very real issue to struggle with trust. But let me tell you the truth. You will never know God's peace, God's joy, until you learn to trust him with every area of your life. Listen to this in Romans uh, 15, verse 13. This is what the apostle Paul writes to the church in Rome. He says this, I pray that God, the source of hope, hope comes from God. He's the source. He's the source of hope. He will fill you completely with what? Joy and peace. Why? Because you trust in him. It comes from trusting, having like a complete trust to God. That is a source of joy and peace for us. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. I think a lot of us, here's the thing, a lot of us like to co-manage our problems with God. Isn't that true? We like to co-manage. You ever heard of a you ever heard of two managers of like an office branch? You ever heard of like two pastors at a church? Well, well, that actually kind of works this time with Tiffany and me. We're two, two lead pastors at one church. It kind of works. But like how about two captains on a ship? You're like it's, it's kind of weird to be able to co. This is exactly what we do. We like to co-manage our problems with God. God, I give it to you, but no, I'm going to take it back. But I'm, I'm going to give it to you, but I'm going to take care of it. But, I, but oh, God, I'm giving it to you because I'm stressed out, but then I'm going to take it back. We like to co-manage our problems with God. <laughs> It's just, it, we tend to do that. We tend to give our troubles to God temporarily. But that's a trap. It's a trap. I'm telling you right now, trying to co-manage your problems with God is a trap. I'll prove it to you. Because actually, the last statement that Jesus makes, he's quoting a scripture. He's quoting Psalm. He's quoting a Psalm. And I'll, I'll read you the whole thing. It might, it might help us understand what's going on here. Psalm 31, verse 4 through 5. Free me from the trap that is set for me. For you are my refuge. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Free me from the trap 
of not trusting. In, it's a trap. It's a trap to think that we can handle things better than God can. It's a trap. It's an absolute trap. Today's message is for all us worriers out there. All us worries. Come on, wave your hand at me if I got anybody who, who, who tends to worry about things. Maybe I'm not looking, don't worry. Who tends to worry about things a little bit more than they should. I'm a worrier. And, hey, and let me just tell you something a little bit. Um, I'm going to out myself and people like me. Pastors are worriers too, you know. We worry about stuff all the time, stuff we can't do nothing about. The exact thing I'm telling you not to do, hey, I'm telling you I do it too. It's a struggle. It's a struggle. Let me get a thumbs up if you got that picture for me. You got that picture for me back there? I got a thumbs up. See, now my, my friend, uh, he, you know, he, he pastors in Stockton, though. You need to know that. In Con- he pastors in Stockton. And, uh, and he said, you know, I, I'm, I don't know what you're talking about with stress. Um, I, I'm feeling just fine. In fact, here, put that picture he sent me up here. He said, who said pastoring a church is stressful? I'm 42. I'm feeling great. What you talking about? I'm not feeling no stress. He, was, he is pastoring in Stockton, though. Again, I think it's a little rougher there. I'm not sure, man. Get that picture out of here. I'm just kidding. That's not my friend. That's not my, that's not him. That's not him. I do have friends that pastor in Stockton and, uh, well, let me just tell you, it's all right. We pastors are worriers too. So let me just go ahead and level the playing field right now. It's not like I have the corner market on being stress-free. I don't. I absolutely, you see this right here? That's all since I started pastoring y'all right there. Right? See, that's white. I, I, I trim it down. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Ministry isn't all that worrisome. Not compared to being a parent. Pastoring ain't hard next to being a parent. See, I, I've got a, I've got an almost 15 year old son who's going to high school now. Oh, I don't got a care in the world, except for every time I see him, I'm like, let me smell your breath, let me look in your eyes. You using those, you smoking that dope again? Come on, let me look up there, look up your nose, look in your ears. I'm like giving him a drug test every single time I see him. Next to being a parent, being a pastor, man, ain't nothing, ain't nothing. Matter of fact, matter of fact, um, I found this um, this letter that was written by written by a son, written to his dad. Uh, it, might, it might be applicable. It might make you feel a little better. Um, there's this letter written. And it, it, it'll help any of you parents out there uh, worrying about your kids. The dad comes home from work to find this letter uh, on the kitchen counter. Here it goes. It says, Dear Dad, it is with great regret and sorrow that I'm writing you. I had to elope with my new girlfriend because I, I wanted to avoid a scene with you and Mom. I've been finding real passion with Jennifer. She's so nice, even with all of her piercings, tattoos, and her tight motorcycle clothes. But not only the passion, Dad, she's pregnant. And Jennifer said that we will be very happy together. Even though you don't care for her very much because she's much older than I am, she already owns her own trailer in the woods, and she has a stack of firewood that's going to last us all winter, Dad. So everything's going to be fine. She wants to have many more children with me, and now I realize that's my dream too. Jennifer has taught me that marijuana really doesn't hurt anyone. We will be growing it for quite a while and trading with her friends for all the cocaine and ecstasy we want. In the meantime, we will pray that science finds a cure for all of her diseases, Dad, because she deserves it. She deserves Don't worry, Dad. I'm 15 years old, and I know how to take care of myself. Someday, I'm sure we'll be back to visit you so you can meet all of your grandchildren, your son, John. Somebody's going, oh, I can't even think. P.S. P.S. Dad, none of the above is true. I'm at the neighbor's house. I just wanted to remind you that there are worse things in life than the report card that is on your desk. (laughs) Love, your son, John. Call me when it's safe to come home. I'm just... That's part, that's part of why we parents worry so much is because we might get a letter like that one day. I pray that none of you do. Whoever Jennifer is, man, I'm trying to preach to her right now. Come on. We're going through this passage today, um, Matthew 6. So if you got your Bible with you, go to Matthew 6 right, right quick. This is uh, the forefront, the utmost passage on the topic of worry that Jesus talks about. It's very powerful, very strong. And um, the whole section is on worry, but the verse before it helps get some context as well. Matthew 6, starting in verse 24, reads like this. No one can serve two masters. Pause. No one can serve two masters. Because it's funny that the Greek word worry, it's actually 
it can be translated like double-minded. Double-minded, like I, I'm worrying a little, I, I'm, I'm giving it to God, but I'm not giving it to God. It's double-minded is, is like worrying. I'm going back and forth. Have you ever been in a, in a worrying situation where you're just going in circles and in circles and in circles, and, you're, and you give it to God, but you take it back, and you put it in your prayer box under your bed, but you take it back out, and you're giving it to God, but you take it back, or maybe you didn't give it, but you just keep on going over and over and over and over again about the things you can't do anything about. That's actually what Jesus talked about, that word worry is double-minded. And, and Jesus says, you can't serve both ways of thinking. You can't serve two masters. It's like saying, God, you got it. No, I got it. For, and, and Jesus goes on to say, for you will hate one and love the other. Either you're going to take care of it all yourself or you're going to l- give it all to God. It, it's it's, it's going to come to a head one day. You will be devoted to one, despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. But I believe this is bigger than just money. It, it is true about money, and money tends to be one of the things that people stress out about the most. It, it, I mean, that's what couples fight about the most. It's what, it's what draws out the biggest stress in us because it, it can take the place of God for security and whatnot. But I, I believe this is bigger than just that. This is not a message about money as it is a message about worry. He says, you can't serve both God and money. You can't serve both God and money. And then he says, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't, make a, they don't work or make their own clothing. Yet Solomon, in all of his glory, was not dressed as beautifully as they are. Pause. Solomon was known as the wisest, greatest, most powerful, richest king that Israel ever had. And Jesus is saying even Solomon didn't have it as good as these lilies over here. And they don't do anything to take care of themselves. They just sit there like a flower, just taking in the sunshine. You know, all they do is sit there. And they are taken care of and come out better than even Solomon in all of his glory. Now, that's a, that's a big statement to make. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, will he, he, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have such little faith? Then he brings it back to a faith issue. Why do you have such little faith to think that my God is not going to take care of you? I do it, you do it, but why? why? Why do we worry so much? Why is worry such an issue? I think even in, in American culture, we, we struggle with this so badly. We worry about things and we stress out about things and we're so, uh, we get so into things and we get, go in those circles in our mind. We struggle with this. That in the big picture, Jesus says these things that you're struggling, they're trivial. But they never feel that way. What is up with that? I may not know why worry is such an issue in our world, but I know that Jesus thought it was important enough to speak on at such great length. So let's see if we can do something about it. I'm going to get actually straight to the application part of the message. This is so important. I, I want to lead you to a, a, a section of your notes called Letting Go of Worry. And we are going to be mostly in, in Matthew 6 here, but... This passage in Philippians, you just can't pass up. This is another writing of Paul that he wrote to a church in Philippi. And it goes like this. Don't worry about anything. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for the advice. <laughs> Don't worry about anything. Right? Instead, pray about everything. Tell God your needs. Now, hang on a second. We, that is that is way bigger than the amount of time it took for me to uh, read it. Prayer is not this. So if you're not sure what prayer is, or maybe you think you know what prayer is, let me me, uh, snuff some misconceptions about prayer. Prayer is not being eloquent with God and talking like you're King James. Okay, prayer is not, oh, Heavenly Father, I beseech thee, O Lord, and I give all my worries to you. And you're like quoting songs. as That's not what prayer is. 
If, if you're doing that, I mean, you, it's potent, you could basically be, but that's not, that's not what it is in and of itself. Prayer is also not rehearsing your problems to God, informing God of things that he already knows about. Now, we all can fall, we, we think that prayer is, oh God, I, I'm going through a hard time. And God's like, really? I had no idea. You're like, God, my, my car broke down. God, I don't have enough money. He's like, you're kidding. I had no clue. Prayer is not telling God about everything going on in your life. Let me tell you what prayer is. Prayer is, and forgive me for being a little cliche about this, but this is just the best way I can think of describing it. Prayer is letting go and letting God have it. When we enter into prayer, when we pray, it's, it's saying, God, okay, I'm, I'm giving this to you. I'm coming into the throne of grace. The curtain's been torn. I can go to you now. I don't have to go through my priest. I don't have to go through a fall. I, I can come straight to you. And God, I'm giving this to you. That's, that's prayer. Giving. You can read what it says. Don't worry about anything, anything. Instead, pray about everything. And it goes on to say, if you do this, you will experience God's peace. If you let it go and truly give it to him, you will experience God's peace. And that's what I want for every single man, woman, and child today. You came in worrying about things today. I know you. <laughs> so did I. You came in worrying about things, but I want you to leave without them. I want you to leave without those worries. I want you to leave here going, all right, God, you can have this. You can have all of me. You can have this issue, and I'm not going to take it back even though I want it. I'm going to give it to you. Finally, you will experience God's peace, with peace, which is far more wonderful for any human mind to understand. In order to really let it go, we're going to have to do a couple things. So let me explain it to you. Number one, in order to finally let your worries go, number one, you have to get to know God. It's in your notes. You can write that in. Get to know God. Or maybe if you've been coming around a while, you can write in, get to know him better. <laughs> get to know him better. Because the more you know him, the more you'll trust in him. I said the more you know him, the more you'll trust in him. Um, I can look back on my life, um, just a personal testimony from me. Um, I can look back on my life, and, and there's a, I've had a lot of testimony with jobs. Like, when I, when I got sober and I got clean and I got saved, it was like from one job to the next for years and years and years. And the more I got to know God and I, the more I got to know the fact that he was going to supply my every need and I would be stressed and stressed and he would just come through in a miraculous way. I'd be like, oh, that was funny. And then I'd go through the same thing again, and I'd need another job because I, I have a criminal record. And so I, I guess employers don't like that very much. I don't, I don't know why. I mean, you're missing out. Okay, I'm just come on. But I would go into these places, and, you know, I'd get to the background check. And there was this one time I was, I was applying for a solar company. I won't tell you which one. But they, I went through the interview, and I was all smiles, and I was really confident. I'm like, man, I can do this. I can help you. And they hired me, and it was a career-type job, and I was actually looking to try and get married to a, a pretty young thing at that time. That would have been a perfect, perfect deal for me. And I show up to my orientation, and they said, oh, uh, by the way, your background check came back. This was so far back, I didn't even know, like, because I had never had a job in my addiction, really, like, not a real one where I had to do background. I didn't know what any of that looked like, so it came back, and they're like, oh, yeah, you're you're a total scumbag, and we don't want you around. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's not very encouraging, is it? But I've been through so many situations like that, and God has just, bloop, come through for me. Shortly after that, somebody shows up to my little part-time minimum wage job, no way I could have supported a family with, and someone from my past showed up and said, hey, you looking for a better job? I'm like, matter of fact, I am. I put out a lot of applications, but that application came to me. And I've just been thro through so many things like that, that in that area, I'm super confident. Because I know God so well in that area of my life. Like, this might sound weird, but try and hear my heart. I am not worried about this job at all. I'm not. 
I, I could lose this job today. I'd be like, doesn't matter. God's going to take care of me. He's done it like a hundred times. He's not going to stop now. It'll probably be a better paying job with less stress too. I just, I'm so confident in that area because letting go of your worry has to do with knowing God and who he is and how he takes care of us. Do, are, are you seeing that? Are you seeing that? There, but there are areas of my life that aren't like that. I'm just being honest with you because there, I haven't seen God move so powerfully in those certain areas of my life. And so I, it just comes from knowing him. So what's the key? The key is knowing God. It's, it's about the thing about knowing someone, though, is it does take time. It does take time. You can't fast track good relationships. Like you can help them along, but you can't like, you don't just show up and like have you can't just have a relationship like that with knowing him overnight. You have to, you have to learn to hang in there. Some people grow in the Lord faster than others. We, we've seen this happen. But it's not a formula. It's just what the two people have been through. Like I, me and God have been through certain things together. So I know I can trust him in areas of my life. It's not formulaic, but there is a key. Get to know him better. Matthew 6, 31 and 32. So do not worry saying. What shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans, people who don't know God, people who don't know his love, people who don't, they worry about that. But your heavenly father knows your needs. Listen to it read another way out of the message Bible, Matthew 6, 32, out of the message. People who don't know God and the way he works, they worry about this. Because they don't know God and they don't know the way he works. My prayer for you and the application to letting go of worry is to get to know God better. How can we get to know God better? In your Bible is one good way. By reading your Bible. Read it every day. Wake up in the morning and read it. Before you're about to go to bed at night, read it. At your lunch break, read it. Man, you can turn that thing on in your car on the way to work and just have God's word read to you. It's easier than ever before. You can know God in, in, by, by, by reading your Bible, by reading your Bible and, and, and getting his, because that's the way he works. You can find out all about the way he works by, by reading his Bible. Another way to do that is by, is by filing the times that God has really blessed you. Every single one of us have situations, I, I believe this, that if we're careful and prayerful and we think about it, Oh, wait, I was going through a bad time, and then something crazy happened, and it was all right. Hmm. It, it helps to remember those things. See, like my, like my testimony, my story, I have filed those things in my heart and in my soul, and I just know that I know that I know that God takes care of these. So every time something happens like that, make it a habit to never forget it and to tell people of those, those stories, those testimonies. And we want both for you here. You know, there's a, there is a big difference between knowing God and knowing how he works. I'll explain the difference. Knowing God, you come to church and you're like, hallelujah, he's good. I gave my life to, to God and I got his heart. And you know God. Very good. You're going to heaven. But then there's also knowing how he works, which is like knowing the Bible, knowing uh, what, he, what he wants from us, what he, he wants for us, those kinds of things. But listen, the, the two can be mutually exclusive. You can know God, but have no clue how he works. <laughs> it's true. It's true. The opposite is true. You can know how he works, but totally miss his heart. Just read the Gospels. Jesus was really stern with that group of people, the people that knew all of his commands, knew all of his word, and they were like, no, it goes like this, but they totally missed his heart. They totally missed his mission. They totally missed his vision. But they were so wound up in how he works that they missed who he was when he was right there in front of them. And that's, that's, a, hard, that's a hard pill to swallow, but the application is this, man. Read, read that Bible. Know how he works and know, and know that he loves you. Know that he's for you. Amen? Amen. Number two, put God first in every area of your life. Matthew 6.33 says this, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Let me put it to you another way. Some of us are worrying about things because you don't have anything else to worry about. I'm serious. I, 
<laughs> I hang out with a lot of preachers and pastors, and so a lot of my jokes are about them. But um, the, the, the church that lacks mission and vision, the one, they're the ones that are worried about what color the carpet is and what color the chairs are and what co- all the trivial stuff. And a lot of us, back to reality, back to real life, a lot of us are worried about things that we can't control because we're not worried about things that God has asked us to do. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all that stuff will be added to you. You're worried because you're worried about the wrong things. You're worried because you don't have anything of real value to worry about. Now, I know it doesn't, that might sound a little strong, like, my wor- what are you saying? My worries aren't important? They are. Those, these things are important to you. You're worried about your family. The family's important. You're worried about your money. Your money's important. Your job is important. I'm, it's not that these things are unimportant. But God has you. So why are you wound up there instead of doing the work that he's called you to do? And you wouldn't be worried about those things if you were focused, laser focused, on his mission and vision. I'm saying you are worried, but not to, not to not be worried, but you're not worried about the right things. You want to overcome worry? Go meet with a hurting friend. You want to overcome your worry? Go have coffee with someone who's going through a hard time and just sit with them and talk with them. So it's, it's amazing how fast your worries float away when you do that. You want to get over your worry and get over your stress? Um, why don't you go love on a lonely grandma in a nursing home that hasn't had a visit in weeks? Tiffany talks about this. It's important, though. We're worried about things because we're not worried about the right things. Go serve at a soup kitchen because if you simply focus on the next right thing that you can do, that God wants you to do, it doesn't leave a whole lot of time for worrying about things you can't change. That's a big concept. That's a big concept. Why do you think that we ask so many people to go through Girl Track like every single week? Girl Track, Girl Track, Girl Track. Dream team, dream team, dream. Is it because we need your help for something? No. You know, we have like a 50% dream team rate. Half of you, like this half of you are serving on the dream team. How many people do we need to take care of those? I mean, like how many can we possibly need? We don't, I'm going to say something, we don't need it. You need it. You need it. Because you don't need to float in here every single week worried about your own problems and then float away still thinking about your own problems. You need a place where you can come, be a part of a team, be a part of the body of Christ, and empty yourself. See, I, I heard someone say, and it's, it's very true, it's not my job to fill your cup. It's my job to empty mine. That's my job. My job is to empty myself. Because for you Christians, let me just remind you, your life is not your own. <laughs> your whole life. The prayer was, I give my life to you. We say that so passingly. And then we go on and we show up in church every single week and it's all about us. It's all about me. But let me tell you, it's not because we need a thing. It's because you need the diversion from all the anxiety and all the stress. And you need to be on that track. But if you're, if you're still exploring faith, if you're not a Christian yet, you haven't given your life to the Lord, let me tell you, you don't have to do that. But I'm telling you, it's, it's a pretty good route it's a pretty safe bet. It's a good thing. I would, I would encourage you. I invite you to try it. I invite you to try it. Do you think Jesus asked us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness because he needed our help? I rest my case. He doesn't need that. We need that. He said that for us. If you're worried and stressed and full of anxiety, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. That's a good place to say amen right there. Amen. I want to take also a minute to to just honor you because every single person sitting here right now, you've given the first part of your day to God. That's pretty cool. The first part of your day, the first part of your week, man, you've, you've put God first. And you've, you know, you know what it's like. You miss church a week, and it's like, ah, something's off. You know, something's amiss. You know, there's a principle there about putting God first in every area of your life with, with your relationships, with your money, with your time, with your talent and your treasure. That's how we talk about it. We put God first with our time, our talent, and our treasure. And I just want to, you know, let you guys, you're doing that. 
you're here doing that. And so, you know, good for you. Way to go. You guys did it. Way to be, way to be you know. When you put God first, he always honors the rest. It's a principle that rings true throughout your life. Last one, number three, letting go. Live one day at a time. Live one day at a time. Don't open the umbrella until it starts to rain. <laughs> you know, it's supposed to rain tomorrow. Do you know that? Well, at least it was yesterday when I looked at my phone. I mean, weatherman doesn't know what's going on these days, it seems like. At least not on Samsung. All you Apple people are like, see, right there. That's your problem right there. <laughs> easy, easy. I got the mic, not you. <laughs> it's supposed to rain tomorrow, but it's sunny outside right now. It's a nice, I was out there. It's really nice. Living your life worried about what might happen tomorrow is like walking outside on a beautiful, sunny, bird chirping day with an umbrella over your head. Blocking yourself from all the joy that today holds. <laughs> I'm just saying, live one day at a time. Because tomorrow, man, it, it'll get here. It'll get here. <laughs> Trust me, you'll have a chance to worry about it when it comes. You'll have plenty of opportunity. Matthew 6.34, therefore don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble for its own. He's saying, man, there's a little bit of rain every single day, so don't worry about the rain that's coming tomorrow. Just focus on today. Just stay in the moment. Stay, and I'll, don't, don't mishear me. I'm not saying don't have a savings account, okay? Pause. Pause. You can have a savings account. You can invest in your retirement. I do that. You know, I'm not saying that. But don't live your life with a, with a rain cloud over your head saying, well, what if Social Security's not around? Ooh. Forget it. When it comes, you'll have plenty of chance. Just do what you can today. Do what you can today, and tomorrow will be better taken care of if you just do that. Let go of what might happen tomorrow. Don't rob yourself of today because of what might happen tomorrow. I want to close with this final quote from Jack Hayford. It'd be fitting that we finally quote him on his book for this series in his book, Jack Hayford. What a man of faith he was. And this is, this is the way he says it at the, end of his, at the end of his book. To live through a bad day, indeed to conclude it, is to place it in the hands of God and leave it there. To place it in the hands of God and leave it there. Not to take it back. Now, you know, th this series has been huge for me personally. But I think it's appropriate at the end of this series, at the end of this four weeks that we've been talking about bad days, talking about stress, talking about worry. I think it's appropriate at the end of this, um, this series to actually give an opportunity to let some things go. I'm going to actually ask um, Nick to come up and play a little guitar because I want to give you an opportunity. Um, and music does have powerful properties to, to loosen our souls a little bit, to loosen our hearts a little bit. And there's some things, I, I just know, there's some things that you've been hanging on to there's some, there's some stress. There's some anxiety that you guys have been hanging on to. Me too. I'm going to take advantage of this time full well. At the conclusion of this series, How to Live Through a Bad Day, I want to give you a chance right here and right now to finally let some things go. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Create some privacy in a crowded room. I want you to just think, this is just you and God right now, okay? It's just you and God right now. Don't think about the person sitting next to you. Don't think about your kids in their classrooms. They're, they're fine. It's just you and God right now. And just in, in the quiet of your heart, you can say it under your breath if you'd like. And in the quiet of your heart, I want you to let, let God draw out the things in your heart that are stressing you out, that are burdening you, that are holding you back from, from seeking him first. Let those things come up. Let those things come to your mind. Now I want you to let it go. Give it to God. 
those things in his capable hands. He can handle it. Let it go. He has you. He loves you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come before you today so grateful and thankful that you have all of our needs met. You have all of our needs met. You are a loving Father, our provider, our shield, our strength, our hope. You love us. You're our Savior. God, we let go today of all the stress, all the anxieties, all the pressure, the expectations, the worries of tomorrow. We let them go right here and now. We let them go. Put them in your hands and we're, we're not coming back for them. We know that you have us. Even if we don't know, we know that you have us. I want to give an opportunity for every single person here to begin a relationship with God. Maybe begin a brand new relationship with God or maybe come back to a relationship you used to have with God, if you've never given your life to Him fully, truly, you grew up hurt hearing about Him, people talk about Him, but you've never really known Him, and you want to give your life to Him and say, God, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I'm, I'm ready to go all in. And I'm going to give you an opportunity in just a moment to give your life to Him. Or if you have drifted, you used to have a relationship with Him. It was awesome. It was wonderful, but something happened along the way, or maybe nothing happened, but you just drifted. Let me tell you that God welcomes you back and celebrates you just like you. If I've described any person in this place today, I want to give you an opportunity right now to just lift your hand and say, God, I'm giving my life to you. Come on, anybody in this place, be bold, lift it up. One, two, three, you can do it. Lift up that hand and say, God, I am coming home to you. I'm giving my life to you. Praise of the Lord. Amen. He is good and he is bringing people back into his kingdom. Come on, church, let's pray together. Let's pray it out. Come on, let's just do this right now. If you believe in the Lord and this is your prayer, if you're ready to give your life to him, let's pray it together. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I give my life to you. I confess my sins. I repent of my ways. I give everything to you. Fill me with your spirit. Make me new. Amen. Come on, can we clap our hands for everybody that has prayed that prayer today?